The Prima Deer, session number 319. Hello and welcome to the three-time Academy Award-nominated podcast, The Prima Years, where we believe that collaboration, not competition, is key to your success. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Gray, and in this podcast, we share with you stories, encouragement, and information that you need to know to help guide you on your path to becoming a physician. Welcome to The Prima Years. My name is Dr. Ryan Gray, as I mentioned already, and I want to thank you for taking some time to be here with me today. Now, if you're listening to this as it goes out, Happy New Year. If you're listening to this in the future, well, welcome. (laughs) I hope you are enjoying your day. I'm glad that you're taking some time to listen to this podcast today. If this is your first time listening, you are in for a treat. We have a great guest, but I, I, I mean in for a treat with this podcast in general. I am blessed to get tons of messages from students who just find the podcast, whether it's a week or two weeks after they find it, and they are blown away by all of the amazing guests, all the amazing information here on the podcast free for you every week. So I would love for you to continue to spread awareness about this podcast in 2019 and beyond. This week we have a great guest, somebody who struggled with multiple alcohol incidences during college and was open and honest about those maybe even if he didn't need to be, in his application. And even though he was open and honest about those struggles, he got multiple interviews and acceptances during his application cycle. So let's go ahead and say hello to Matt and talk about his path to medical school. Matt, welcome to the pre-med year. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Great to be here. When did you first realize that you wanted to be a physician? I first realized that I wanted to be a physician after I came to uh, undergrad. I knew I wanted to do something health-related. I was born with a permanently detached retina in my left eye, and I was sort of over able to adapt and overcome that to live a relatively normal life. Um, I didn't really have any uh, disabilities as far as driving or anything like that, and I actually became our high school's varsity quarterback Um, so I was able to adapt to that, but there are so many people with these debilitating diseases and disorders that aren't able to adapt by themselves. And so that was really what was the initial motivating factor to go into healthcare. And then sort of my love for, uh, leadership sort of drove me toward the specific doctor route. Interesting. How does a quarterback without depth perception know how far to throw a ball? It's a lot of muscle memory. (laughs) Um, it was a lot of extra time just practicing out on the field and it was it wasn't it didn't feel like work to me it was more fun because I loved what I was doing and so it was the same when I played basketball too I was I shot a lot of free throws to get that muscle memory down and became our sort of designated free throw shooter in my junior and senior year interesting so so no left eye so permanently permanently blind in your left eye uh, but still able to go out and do kind of anything and everything you want Correct. Yeah. It's that extra motivator. Yeah. And it's been really nice to talk about it in uh, interviews and applications and that sort of thing. Let's talk about that since you brought it up. So uh, we've had another guest on the show, Jeff, a while ago, who wasn't born with uh, blindness in one eye, but has a degenerative eye condition causing blindness over time. Uh, And obviously his is a little bit different because he's legally blind in both eyes and will will lose his vision uh, slowly over time versus you i mean maybe there's a potential risk for your other eye to have some sort of spontaneous uh separation of your retina but you're blind in one eye not the other what was that like talking to jeff he's like i want to avoid talking about my disability and it sounds like you were open to talking about uh being blind in one eye yeah absolutely and that's sort of how it's been growing up because my left eye, um, I actually had it had to have it removed this past semester. But before then, it looked uh, sort of abnormal. And so growing up, even as a like a younger kid in elementary school, I would have people asking about it. And it kind of just became part of my identity. And I got used to explaining like, oh, I'm blind in one eye. Mm. Uh, that's why it looks like this. And sort of as I learned more about the science behind it, I could explain why there's sort of this 
glassy look in it with a cataract and so on. And um, that sort of being comfortable, uh, that ha being part of my identity, uh, kind of just segued into talking about it in medical school applications and interviews. And specifically at interviews, I think a lot of a lot of my interviewers would bring it up and sort of make this big deal about it, how they're trying to picture themselves uh, living with one eye and how that would be different um, and sort of being able to balance between making it seem like like I've never known any different. So it's not as big of an adaptation for me as it may be for them, mm -hmm. but also trying not to sort of downplay the importance of it in developing me as a person was kind of an interesting uh, balance. There are probably thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of uh, humans out there with a detached retina who are blind in one eye, who have whatever their disability is, and they don't give a second thought to becoming a physician. They just go and see the doctor all the time and go about their, their life doing whatever they want to do. What do you think it is about... Uh, your journey that led you to to really going, you know what, I, I, I see the doctor all the time for my eye. This is kind of cool. I want to to do this for a living. Sure. Um, when I was when I was growing up, my my family moved around a lot, uh, mostly around Wisconsin, but we did live in Illinois for a period of time. And they were sort of random moves. So we didn't know that far ahead of time. And so with each move, I came to meet a new primary care physician. Um, we got in touch with an ophthalmologist who I would go and see uh, pretty regularly. And so being able to see a wide range of different uh, MDs and DOs and what they did. And as I grew up, how I interacted with them, what I liked about what they did, what I didn't like. I could ask them questions, that sort of thing, um, sort of building those relationships and the sort of exposure I had to it at a young age is really what pushed me into that field. Do you have family that's in healthcare? Yes. My, both of my parents are medical technologists oh, okay. and then my dad switched over to sort of hospital administration more recently. Okay. So there's that level of, of interaction as well and exposure. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's been a huge help and even just hearing their stories about their jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So you, you start college, you go to college, and it, it doesn't sound like you knew right away that you wanted to be a physician. Um, what what led you down that path of wanting to be a physician versus a nurse versus uh, maybe a, a medical technologist like your parents? Sure. Um, so at first, I, I'm really interested in sports and watching sports, playing sports, all the above. Um, so originally, I, my thought was, well, physical therapy would be an yeah. interesting job. <laughs> and I got to shadow a physical therapist. Um, I talked with my dad a lot about what that would entail, what that would look like uh, versus an athletic trainer. And that was sort of the comparison I was making at first. And uh, my dad sort of challenged me. He's like, so you're looking at these different jobs. Why not a nurse? Why not a PA? Why not a physician? And so um, I kind of had to do more research on that end as to like why I was limiting myself in that scope. And, uh, the more I was looking into it, the, and the more sort of I shadowed and got out and Googled, uh, did that sort of research, the more it just sort of felt like being a physician and being in that multidisciplinary sort of across the entire healthcare spectrum leadership role, uh, fit my personality and what I really wanted to do. Um, as far as why I didn't want to go into a, a medical technologist type role, uh, for the last almost two years now, I've been a phlebotomist, or it's called a laboratory support technician. So inpatient phlebotomy, EKGs, and then specimen processing in the lab. Mm -hmm. So I've gotten to work with medical technologists quite a bit. And I don't think it, there's that level of patient contact that I really en would enjoy. Okay. What has been the hardest thing so far in your your journey to medical school? My the hardest thing in my journey is uh, my past mistakes that I made uh, related to multiple alcohol violations in undergrad. And what what happened there? Uh, so my freshman year, I sort of I came into undergrad 
um, didn't really have any past experience with alcohol or anything like that. And so I was sort of experimenting in these social situations. And the second month of undergrad, I, I got a, an on-campus, sort of in the dorms, uh, alcohol violation that I sort of just shrugged off. And then the following semester, it happened again. And um, there really was sort of a lack of maturity there where I wasn't thinking that uh, in depth about why this happened, what this meant for my future, like how this could affect me, uh, not only in uh, not only externally with jobs and so on, but internally, like the, my thought process, the way I think that sort of thing and the way I spend my free time. Um, so I sort of shrugged that second one off too. And then I went through sophomore year. Um, then the summer after sophomore year, I met up with a couple of buddies who were on leave, active duty military leave. Uh, and we went up to one of their cabins and one of my friends offered to be our, our designated driver for the night. And so uh, we went out uh, to a bar up there and he was driving us back and my vehicle broke down on our way home. And so on the side of the road, uh, while it was broken down, I made the decision uh, under the, the influence of alcohol to get in the driver's seat to sort of try to figure out what was going on. I was trying to uh, start the turn the engine over and so on. And as I was doing so, a squad car pulled up behind us. Mm. And because I made the decision to get into the driver's seat under the influence uh, with the keys in the ignition trying to start the vehicle, I was uh, charged with an o operating while intoxicated. And so sort of the fallout of that, um, both uh, legally and mentally and so on, was uh, definitely difficult to overcome. At any point, did you hear from anybody that said, you know what, you, you probably won't be able to get into medical school now? Um, personally, I didn't hear that from anybody. If I went on online to a specific website where I would Google, like <laughs> if this had happened in the past, mm -hmm. uh, yes, there were people that had had this happen to them before, had done, made this type of mistake before, and there were people that replied saying, don't even try. Uh, but none of my advisors, uh, none of my, my parents, my family, my friends, um, the people in student life at my university that I went and talked to afterwards, none of them ever even hinted that saying that, no, you can't do this. Did you ever reach out to any medical schools to get advice? I did, yes. What, uh, what, what did you ask and what did they say? I sort of made it in a hypothetical way because I was still testing the waters and how medical schools would react to this. Um, and many of them said, yes, we will still consider your application. Um, their main focus is uh, not so much on the mistakes, but on how you changed what you've done to learn and grow from them. Yeah. And how, do you, how did you tell that story in your application? It was difficult in the primary application because they only give you so many characters. And there's this really weird um, law in the state of Wisconsin where the first offense OWI, which is the same thing as a DUI or uh, driving under the influence of alcohol, um, that it's not a misdemeanor or felony. So it's not a criminal charge, which is odd because in Ed, for the 49 other states, it would be. It's just a traffic um, ticket, basically? Yes, correct. It is a very expensive traffic ticket. Interesting. Yes. Um, but you still do get your like license taken away for a period of time and so on. Um, but it's odd how that works. And there was sort of this dilemma going on. And did I want to include this in my primary application? And did I need to disclose this in my primary application? Yeah. How'd you figure that out? Um, I asked a lot of advisors and it was a lot of gray area answers where no one has ever really dealt with this before. <laughs> um, it was sort of, it's up to you. Uh, sort of deal. And my mindset at the time and trying to in learning and growing from the mistake was owning up to it and uh, just being honest to myself and others about what happened. And so that's why I did decide to include it in my my primary application. Wow. Um, and then I tried to fill the limited characters up with um, with sort of a detailed explanation that did have some grammatical errors in it. But they were to try to put the, get the point across about what happened and how I've learned and grown in that uh, limited amount of space. 
looking back at it, I may have gone to talk to a, a lawyer about it first just to get a more comprehensive outlook. But at the time, it was more so to focus on my own personal growth and owning up and being honest about what had happened. And then from there, my hope was that schools wouldn't uh, screen me out or exclude my application just based on that and would give me a secondary application so that I could further explain myself in the secondaries. Where did you put this information? Because you're you're not marking yes to being arrested unless unless you just said yes, uh, even though it really wasn't an arrest. Uh, or did you find room to squeeze it into a secondary or a personal statement? Where, where did you find space for this? I did mark yes under the um, misdemeanor. Uh, my thought process was that in any other state, it was going to be it would be considered a misdemeanor. So that's where I yeah. included it. And then at the very beginning, I included a disclaimer that says, "In the state of Wisconsin, this is not considered a criminal charge or misdemeanor, uh, and may not appear on criminal records." Interesting. So, so I think ninety. 90- Nine percent of potential students listening to this are, are like screaming at their their phone or car right now, going, "Why would you disclose that if you didn't have to?" Uh, oh, yeah. And again, depending on on uh, what a lawyer would say, um, it, it sounds like there's just a weird one state out of the fifty that has this weird rule that that it's not a misdemeanor offense. Yes, and looking back at it, I think I would have handled it differently. Interesting. So so let's talk about that. So you. You think you would have maybe not disclosed looking back? Yes, um, I understand why I did at the time with my mindset, but I also think that may have limited um, what schools did and did not look at me. After talking with a couple different physicians that were or still are on admissions committees, they admit to this sort of being this complex admissions process sort of being broken because it is so competitive and marking that box yes it's even an automatic though filter. It, exactly <laughs> yeah. exactly yes it puts me into that group interesting so so maybe potentially not marking yes there because technically you didn't have a misdemeanor and maybe in a secondary anything else you want to tell us yes just in, yeah it, for both for my own purpose of being honest and open about it and in case it were to come up in any search results or anything like that, I, I wouldn't want it to sound like I was trying to hide it. Yeah, interesting. So you you did talk about it. You did get at least one interview to medical school. How did how did that discussion go during interviews, if at all? Did it come up? Yes, there were um, two different interviews where I was asked about it. Um, one was a two on one. So there was two, the, two of them with one of me and they asked me a very open ended question about it, um, about sort of the alcohol, um, violations, uh, sort of all three of them. And luckily about a couple of weeks before then I had my one on one interview session with you where I got to practice and get some helpful feedback. And so I had without sort of having it down word for word, I had practiced and in my mind what I wanted to say to them about it. And Mm -hmm. they took it with a very sort of positive uh, manner. So that was that made me feel more comfortable about talking about it. And in the second time I was asked about it, it was at a panel interview. And so I was a lot more intimidated. I think Uh, the panel interview was not members of the med school either. They were local community members uh, who were there for the purpose of bringing in recruiting or for interviewing uh, applicants. And so I thought that one was a lot more intimidating because I had so many different people um, like sort of staring at me while I was answering (laughs) their question. I was trying to keep my thought process going while maintaining eye contact with all of them. Um, But they asked me more indirectly. They said, have there been any challenges on your application um and immediately as soon as they said that it was ding 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 i know exactly what they're asking about yeah the the story and i think i told you this when when we did the mock interview together the the story of my friend was driving the car broke down i just happened to get in the driver's seat when the squad car pulled up sounds very fabricated did you get any sort of pushback be like did this really happen i did not know which was uh, which is a good thing because I 
feel like it would be hard to explain like it's hard to sort of back up that kind of story that seems so um yeah fabricated like you said but it's it, I just had to put it out there there's no other way to explain it other than this is what happened and more so it was more so focusing on what I'd done afterwards to grow and learn from it than the actual mistake itself how does going through this process for for most pre-med students they don't know that they're going to get into medical school period and then you are going through this pre-med journey with these uh, alcohol incidents, uh, knowing that you're going to have to overcome likely a bigger hurdle. How does that affect your motivation and, and, and really drive to continue to do well as a pre-med, knowing that, that maybe there's not even a chance that you can get into medical school? Honestly, I think that was more motivating than anything. Um, that, that still that strong desire to get in, um, number one, it, it, it made me sort of realize that I needed to remain sort of more optimistic, even more so after this happened. And so sort of thinking of the negatives, the what ifs, if I didn't get into med school, that would have, it would have led to a lot of, uh, nonproductive sort of, um, thinking, I guess, or non-productive thinking time, whereas if I stayed optimistic about it and stayed motivated about it, I could uh, succeed in the classroom and extracurriculars, my job, and so on. So it was never, what if I get into med school? It was sort of keeping that mindset of, I'm going to get into medical school. What was the hardest thing outside of the, the alcohol, quote-unquote, problems that you had? What, what was the hardest thing that uh, you faced as a pre-med? Balance, absolutely balance. Um, even after following the alcohol violation, I was still my school's pre-med club president for the last two years. And then I was working at my job and I had these volunteering and I needed to shadow. And so it was maintaining that balance where I knew I needed to do well in classes and studying for the MCAT and my job and so on, but also maintaining that healthy lifestyle where I have time to cook meals, work out have fun, relax. Um, so I'd say that finding that balance and that time management skills was difficult at first, but it's uh, definitely improved since then. What did you do to get balance or, or find balance? So we talked earlier about how I like sports a lot, and I'm a huge uh, Wisconsin fan. So if there's any sort of Wisconsin sports, basketball, football, uh, baseball, I will watch the Packers, Badgers, Brewers. I think a lot of times that can be relaxing, uh, maybe not this season with the Packers, but <laughs> um, no, like watching sports is relaxing to me. I'll play movies or watch movies. I'll play video games at times. I enjoy working out. So uh, there's quite a few stuff. Even naps are, I find helpful. Nice. Napping as an adult is one of the best things ever. It is. And I will never take it for granted. <laughs> um, so you, you, uh, are going through this process and you're figuring out where to apply to medical schools. How much did the the potential red flags weigh into where you decided to apply to school? I guess it didn't really weigh into specifically where. It more weighed into how many schools I applied to. I remember I was listening to one of your podcasts a while back and you said – you were talking about how many schools to apply to, and the number was always, you always said to not apply to a crazy amount of medical schools unless, mm -hmm. and then you listed a couple of specific instances, and one of those specific instances was sort of these red flag alcohol-related violations, yeah. and so that's exactly where I fit into, and so um, I lived on ramen noodles for quite a while. It was sort of a, a cheap meal because my paychecks were going directly into applying to a ton of different schools just so that with all these schools and their different, the different ways they view admissions, they would may look at or the different ways they view applicants. They may look at this application more holistically or in a different way. How many schools did you end up applying to? I applied to 43. Oh, a lot. All, yes. all MD or MD and DO? There was, I believe, 30, 30 MD and 13 DO. Okay. And how much, roughly, does that cost a student applying to 43 schools? 
I have not crunched the numbers <laughs> quite yet because I <laughs> was scared. really scared to see what it is. Yes. Yeah, uh, it would be a lot. And we, we have actually a, an applications cost estimator on the website now. So um, if you're listening to this and want to go see, uh, just go under tools and the op- application estimator is there. Um, so 43 applications marking on the application that you have this misdemeanor, potential misdemeanor offense, uh, pseudo misdemeanor offense. How many interviews did you end up getting? I ended up with, as of this far, five different interviews. Um, and then I actually just recently withdrew all my applications. Okay. The so, rest of the applications. Interesting. So five interviews. Uh, right. For somebody with this this potential big red flag, what do you think was was the kind of separated you to allow you to get an interview at these five schools, even with this disclosure on the application? I think it was um, sort of a multitude of factors. Um, I my I, I did well in the MCAT, and my GPA was on the higher end, so that was definitely not hurting me. Uh, but on top of that, it was, I believe, how I worded my personal statement, um, thanks to your uh, pre-med playbook, um, as well as sort of what I've been involved in my extracurriculars, uh, making sure that they were these extracurricular activities, that this volunteering and working, and uh, that was sort of longitudinal that I had done for a year plus, rather than sort of just volunteering here and there showing showing good consistency instead of just trying to cram it in right before your uh, right before the application absolutely yes yeah so you're not you're not checking boxes this is actually kind of who you are at least for a, a longer period of time and not just somebody that's like oh crap i need to do these things yes and i actually i got extremely lucky with uh, my volunteering especially because i've been at this adult fitness program for the last almost two years and while i'm there i get to uh, help help adults who have had health problems work out, and I get to actually spend about an hour three times a week playing volleyball with these people. And they're actually pretty dang good. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. So you have five interviews. You had at least one acceptance. Uh, did you have any other acceptances? I did. Yes, I had two more on top of that. Very cool. And how how with. Three different acceptances. How did you choose the school that you ended up going to? I chose the school I ended up going to, which is uh, the Medical College of Wisconsin's Green Bay campus. Uh, Number one, because it's only about an hour away from where my parents live, so I can drop in for a meal or laundry whenever. Um, One of its focuses is primary care, which is a very strong interest of mine. the interview day when I went there, it, they made it feel very homey. They made it very personalized, called you by name. I knew one of the um, admissions uh, people, sort of the person who guided you through the day because they travel around the state or the Midwest talking at undergrads to pre-med students. And then also the fact that it's a three-year medical school. So I'll be saving that whole extra year of time and money. Very cool. Well, congrats on on all of your success uh, with the application process and overcoming some obstacles along the way. Uh, One quote-unquote obstacle that hasn't been an obstacle in your life is uh, being blind in one eye. Has that ever come up in any of your interviews as a potential hindrance to your future as a physician? Yes, it has. And it's um, one of the questions I got was, how does this, or how do you feel that this could impact what field of medicine you go into or what specialty? Mm. And it was kind of, they were looking for being honest with being honest with yourself about how it may limit you. And I talked about how that lack of depth perception may hinder me from going into a uh, career in a specific surgery where it requires a lot of depth perception, like I, like being an ophthalmologist or something related that ironically being an ophthalmologist. Yeah. Um, so it was just being honest about that, honest about your limitations and knowing that there are some things out of your control. Yeah. And and being prepared for that question beforehand uh, potentially seemed like it would it would help you give give you that reflection and that self-awareness to talk about it. Absolutely. And that's all I feel like that's a lot of what they were looking for in interviews is that making sure that you don't think that you are the 
perfect applicant or going to be the perfect doctor that you're able to talk about your own sort of limitations or your own weak points and, and sort of, uh, owning up to it. Yeah, it's huge. I, I do so many mock interviews with students and I, w one of the questions that I almost always ask is, is what are your weaknesses? And, and I really want to know, like, what are your weaknesses? I don't want, I don't want to hear the, the spin of, but this weakness really is a strength because of X, Y, Z. And I, I want you to, to be honest and self-aware and, and humble and, and know that you are not God's gift to uh, the medical field. Exactly. Which, which actually almost seems like the opposite of what you're always taught, or at least what you always think of when you go into a job interview and they mm -hmm. ask you for your greatest weakness and you want to immediately turn it into, but, but this could also be seen as a strength yeah. because it's, it's just sort of a different interface. It's different. And that's why I always say like the, the medical school interview is not, is not a job interview. And so it's hard if, if you're at a undergrad institution that doesn't have uh, really strong pre-health advising. If it's a career counselor giving you mock interviews, the advice that they give you may not be the best for medical schools because they may be basing that information ba uh, on a, a typical job interview, which is different. Yeah, even more of a reason to check out the pre-med playbook guide <laughs> medical school interview. Hey, nice plug there. Good job. <laughs> um, that's awesome. What, uh, what kind of lasting words of wisdom do you have for a student out there who, who may have some potential red flags, who's questioning if they can, can do this and actually get into medical school? What, what do you have to say to them? I have to say to them to reach out to fellow pre-meds uh, whether it be at your own school or on the um, the Facebook group that that you have associated with you, there's so mm -hmm. much sort of positive energy and collaboration that sort of goes into it. Um, that there's there's just so much positive language. You can ask a question to people in person that are pre meds, and they're able to sort of relate with you or give you um, this advice. But even more so on the Facebook page is that there's such a large diverse group of pre-med students who all have shared the common goal, the same common goal that they're able to give you a sort of advice that you may not have gotten from an advisor or family or friends that aren't it, that aren't pre-meds that don't know all that goes into it. All right, so there you have it again. That was Matt sharing his journey to medical school, to an acceptance, even through all of the struggles and and hiccups along the way. Now, I think the moral of the story here is you, you need to be open. You need to be honest. You need to, I think the biggest thing, you need to own your shortcomings. Too many students try to blame the teacher for their bad, bad grades, blame the situation for, for getting arrested, getting in trouble. And Matt, all along the way, said, you know what? It's my fault. I did it. Yep, here's what I've learned. Here's what I'm doing to work on it. Here's how I fixed it. Etc. He owned his problems. And I've talked to admissions committee members before, one specifically at a conference recently, and we were talking about one specific student. It was a pre-med advisor and this admissions committee, the, the director of admissions for a med school. And they were talking about a troubled student and how the student hadn't owned up to his or her struggles. And that was one of the reasons why the med school wasn't uh, uh, welcoming the student for an interview. And they, they looked at me and they're like, what do you think of that? I'm like, that's you, you have to own it, right? I wouldn't expect anything less from the school and you shouldn't either. So if you've struggled in your journey, you really need to take a deep look at yourself and figure out how you can own that situation. Now, there's a great book that I just finished reading called Extreme Ownership. And it's a really good book and it talks all about you need to own everything that happens in life. All right, that is it for today. Again, share this podcast with your friends, with your family, et cetera. Uh, your pre-med advisors, let them know the podcast is here. It's free and it's not going anywhere in 2019 or anytime in the near future. I hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time here on The Pre-Med Years.